Hi guys, welcome back to the Soccer Queens podcast. Today I am joined by someone I really look up to in the industry. He is not only a colleague of mine, but also a really good friend. And I'm just so grateful that he's joining me today because we're recording this on a Friday afternoon, his time. And I just really can't wait for him to share his knowledge on youth development and performance training for soccer players, as well as coach mental health, because that's a topic that we don't talk about a lot, but it is extremely important if we really want to serve ourselves first, but also be the example for our athletes. So Potty Roach, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege and honor to be invited to chat with you. Um, I know we've had some amazing chats Sadly, not in person yet, but hopefully when things set a little bit more, we'll be able to visit the States or you come visit the UK and love to meet you in person. You've been uh, really, really inspirational and helpful to me across the last 12 to 24 months. So it's an honor to be on here. I'm, I'm really glad we connected and, and that means a lot. And it's just, it's so important us coaches have that strong community where we can bounce ideas off each other, but also be, be good friends and really talk about things we're struggling with and what we want to do. And it's, it's just so important right now. And I know you have an extensive resume as far as your coaching, and I want you to brag about it and highlight yourself. So for the listeners who don't know who you are, please give a background on where you started as a coach and where you are now. Um, I suppose we'll start from where I am now and work backwards, if that's okay. Yeah. And um, I'm currently the lead academy uh, strength and conditioning coach for Arsenal Football Club based in London in the UK. Um, they're a Premier League club um, in, or a Premier League soccer club. And um, I've been with them nine seasons now. The first four seasons, I was in charge of the U9 to U16 program. And now I'm in kind of overseeing the U18 uh, to U23 program. But my predominant work day to day is with the U18s and I'll speak about that, why I choose to work with that squad later on um, and that age group. Um, before that, I spent six seasons with um, Irish rugby based in the Munster province, which is the southern province of Ireland. And there's, there's four professional rugby teams in Ireland. And I worked with um, southern province Munster for almost six years full time and then I suppose two or three years part time with that where I worked with the Irish under-20 national team and the first team national team at the 2011 World Cup in New Zealand and the Junior World Cup in 2013, which is on the 20s, U20s, before moving to the UK. Prior to that, I have a varied experience in collegiate athletes, if you want to call them, uh, what, um, say in America, collegiate or college athletes, um, university athletes, working across a range of different sports from frisbee to dance to sailing to badminton to uh, track and field um, and before that I ran a looked after a small gym in university where I where I studied and got my undergrad and along the way there that's where I kind of got my first taste for strength and conditioning when I suppose in Ireland certainly in the southern Ireland the strength and conditioning in 2000 2001 2002 um, wasn't really a set profession at the time there was no real clear pathway to how to be a strength and conditioning course you kind of fell out of it into a from personal training background or a sports science background or um, athletic trainer background and you there was no kind of formal strength and conditioning education um, there is now a substantial amount of it and it's now a really fast growing industry but um, yeah I kind of learned my trade through learning Olympic weightlifting from Friends and colleagues, an old friend and mentor of mine, Billy Cable. I started a bit of bodybuilding with a guy called Bernard O'Brien, who taught me really when I was 17, 18, what training was about. Um, played lots of sport growing up, the Gaelic games, uh, played soccer, done track and field. And yeah, just I'm an early developer. I'm only five foot, so I stopped growing quite quick. I was powerful and quick, very young. Um, but then, then others caught up and I couldn't, the team sports just didn't suit me. So I ended up taking up Olympic weightlifting, which kind of really got me into strength and condition because I became the strength power guy and, you know, local teams, local rugby clubs, hockey clubs were kind of seeking out someone to implement gym training at the time, 2002, 2003, when, you know, it was starting to become popular as part of the development of the players and 
I suppose from there, just knocked on to full-time employment with Irish rugby and then uh, and Arsenal here. And uh, I suppose along the way, uh, the education pathway for me was an undergrad in business and leisure management. Um, I wasn't brainy enough or smart enough to get into sports science through the Irish system. Um, so I kind of fell into the business sports management side of things. And then from there, just done personal training qualifications, weightlifting qualifications, and actually got my the NSEA CSCS back in 2007. That was my first formal um, sports training conditioning qualification. And now I'm accredited through the UK Strength and Conditioning Association, the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association. And my master's degree is from Perth, uh, Edith Cowan in Perth, Australia, where the, the Dr. Dr. Sophia Nymphus and Dr. Greg Half have been, Dr. Mike Newton, Rob Newton have been huge influences on, on my, my education and work. And um, now I currently sit on the board, the board of directors from the membership director for the UK Strength and Conditioning Association, because I really believe in trying to give back some knowledge, some experience, some failures I've made to, to our members and to, you know, potential members and and, and those young coaches are coaches that are, are people out there that are changing professions and want to become coaches. I believe that I have a lot to help offer them and I want to reach out to the community and help. So that's where I'm sitting at the moment. And uh, that's in a nutshell. But um, my LinkedIn profile is, is open to anyone if you want to have a quick look at my education and uh, experience background there. But, but a lot of what I deliver day to day is... Um, based on mistakes I've made and experience I've gained. So those those certificates and accreditations I have might seem like I'm chasing paper, but they were got along the way out of, sometimes out of necessity. I got a job in 2002 full-time in the university and I needed a qualification. I didn't have it, even though I had been strength and conditioning for four or five seasons. So I'd done the CSCS, and, and, which was the only one kind of available in Europe at the time. And now it's, it's taken off. So it's, that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, I suppose along the way, I trained a lot of academies. I was involved with a lot of academy youth athletes or developmental structures. Now, academy athletes in rugby are much later developers than uh, academy athletes in football or soccer or athletics or gymnastics. So it's quite varied. My experience at age grade that I've, I've coached, and I suppose I found my most interest and I suppose my passion was for developmental athletes and long-term athletic development that was something I got a real taste with with Irish rugby because I was looking after the academy for Munster and all the age grade clubs and it was Dr. Liam Hennessy and my, my former boss Des Ryan who kind of they were pushing long-term athletic development through the Irish rugby pathway um, and that was where I got a real taste for athletic development for the youth athlete and that longevity and development and patience required to you know, see what you see now and, and get it to professional level in a number of years. I just find that really exciting and I find that um, really stimulating to see development across a long period instead of going in, uh, you know, driving a hard program for six to 12 months, winning a championship and then moving on to the next job. I believe my skill set is best suited to the, the, the long, slow process of, of uh, developing players and athletes. And that's what I love about your work is you really lean into that long-term pathway and you are, you're very honest with, with what it takes. And it's, it's far more rewarding that way for not only the athlete, but also for the coach to just see that whole trajectory. And it also is a best interest for the safety of the, the youth player. And I, I have a question and I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here, but looking at today's youth soccer environment in, in the UK or even in the US, what do you think youth soccer players need the most from an athletic development standpoint? That's a very interesting question. And it's, um, I suppose, even in nine seasons here, I've seen the athlete coming in the door is different every year. Um, and I, I think right now, certainly from, and this is anecdotal, this is not, uh, you know, this isn't the study I'm running or whatever. I, um, I think because our young players, even though they're elite athletes and they're elite soccer players in an academy system and they train five times a week and they do athletic development three to four times a week and they play two games a week outside of that they don't do much other work like the the academy the 
the soccer academy setup has become very, you know, it's a long season. It's 47 weeks for us. So my athletes don't get a chance uh, to do anything else. They don't get to play badminton, basketball, cricket, rugby. They don't have time. And I think for the younger athletes, certainly from, you know, the under nine, the U9 to the U16, maybe U15, you know, that, that little release from a really structured, formalized academy system where they can go and play basketball in school, or I think that's really missing um, from, a, I suppose, a, de- a holistic development point of view, that early specialization. And if they have to specialize early, unfortunately, here in the UK, because like we've got 16, 17 year olds who are making debuts in the Premier League. So they have to be ready, um, even though they're young athletes. So that understanding has to be there as well. But Definitely, I think that overall movement, I've seen a lot of foot, ankle, foot and ankle health is poor. I think the football, the soccer boot now has offers little or no support. They're getting lighter and thinner. And um, I'm seeing that, you know, people are they're getting the sizes of the feet wrong. We're, we're finding a lot of foot stuff. Um, if you want to talk about development, and that's only base level, but they are their tools. They're their weapons, is their feet. You can have a big engine and big powerful hamstrings and uh, glutes and all the things you need to accelerate. But if, if your boot, if your feet are in poor quality and you haven't got good health, then I think you're missing out on, on reactive uh, strength. You're missing out on change of direction ability, etc. cetera. Um, also just overall, I think overall robustness. When I say robustness, that, that ethic of, okay, no matter what, I'm going to work hard. That kind of seems to be slipping away from a lot of young athletes now, because I think, we're failing them. We're giving them too much. And I know that's a generational thing, um, but I've certainly seen it even in the last two, three, four seasons. We're putting, I call it scaffolding. We're putting more scaffolding around the young player every day, whether that's psychosocial help or it's nutrition help or it's, they, they don't have to think for themselves really. They don't have to go, okay, why am I doing this exercise? Okay, if Paulie's not here, what do I do? I don't really know what I should do. When, you know, and I try to encourage a lot of free, <laughs> It looks lazy from the outside. If you're a colleague of mine, you might go, here's Paul, he's given up here. Because in some sessions, I let them, okay, let me see you do your own pre-training prep now. The game is tomorrow. This is your opportunity to, you know what you think you need. Those Off you go, let me see. And often it's a bit loose and it's a bit, oof. Um, but actually, I think we are disabling them in lots of ways because we do everything for them and everything is structured. And because your boss is going to go, show me his athletic development program, show me his pathway. What are we doing here, here, here? Um, we saw that a lot actually if there's a period of time where we get some break like for Christmas um, there'll be 8-10 days off and straight away I'll be asked where's, where's the program for Christmas have they a program for Christmas and in my brain I'm going I don't want to give them a program for Christmas they've trained for 27 weeks uh, structured formal training how about we, we let them go and you know, meet their buddies for a game of football or you know, meet their buddies for a game of cricket and maybe go for a park run or you know um, but I think there's that fear that if we're not um, structuring training all the time, if we're not implementing our philosophy and our pathway all the time, that that player might miss out on an opportunity to develop for that period of time. But So I think, yeah, overall, foot and ankle stuff, very important. I'm seeing lots of foot stuff, um, which isn't talked about, really. If you talk about holistic development, no one really works on their feet, which is, is strange because they're footballers. But um, I'm certainly honing in on that at the moment and overall I just think structurally we're, we do too much um, too much for athletes and for young players now I'm so glad you mentioned the, the foot problem because a lot of my players are probably listening to this episode but I, I literally put in their programs go walk outside barefoot like wear your shoes as little as possible and it's such a small fix that leads to amazing results and just really strengthening the foot and getting the mobility of the ankle and not restricting your, your bones. And it's, it's something so basic and, and you always reinforce the basics just as much with, with your older players, but it's, it is something youth are missing and the free play as well. Like you said, like every, kid is pushed to specialize in most countries. And I think you nailed it as far as like, we are failing the kids and adults need to take responsibility and find ways to give players that playback and that autonomy 
And it's, it's so interesting that early specialization is becoming this thing that people are pushing and they're like cheering on, but they also have to realize you can still give the athlete that playful environment, that unstructured environment. And it's not being, it's not you being lazy as a coach. It's just you saying, Hey guys, like, here's what's going to help your creativity and navigating social situations and managing your emotions and just figuring out how to work in your environment without an adult telling you what to do. Um, so what are some things you do? Uh, I know you, you gave the example of having your team do like the pregame warm up and movement prep. What are some other things you do to give them that autonomy back? So to get, um, and that's, yeah, like we, I live in a world of early specialization, so I can't be damning of the sport because it, it is what it is. And it's a fantastic sport, but they have to specialize early really uh, because the, the demands of the academy. And, and you are right, as adults, we fail. We forget they are still, like the majority of the athletes I train are between 16 and 18. They're still technically teenagers. They're not men yet. And um, even though they might look like that. And we're, we're asking a 16-year-old who's coming from school part-time into a full-time program to be an adult. Like, he's finished school four weeks ago, now he's in a full-time program, and he needs to be an adult. So how do I take that away? It's, it's interesting how I try to... There's, sometimes they find a way without me guiding it as well. I, I'll give you an example. Like, we've got a football tennis area in our performance gym. Our, our gym is beautiful. I'm blessed with facilities. And, and there's a football tennis area, like you can play 2v2, 3v3, but they do smash the football around the gym. And sometimes people are lifting weights or, or the, the women's team are in and they're trying to get ready and they're smashing balls around. So often then I go, no, no ball away. And I'll throw the ball away into, up onto the balcony and I'll go and see the physio and I'll come back in saying, my prep is starting in two minutes, boys, be ready. And I come in and then somehow the little, the little half hedgehogs with the spikes on it, they'll They'll have taped two of them together and now they're playing keep ups with a little hedgehog thing that's meant to be used for stability. It's just, and you have to laugh. <laughs> They'll always, we, I think as, as adults and coaches, we feel we're not doing our job if we're not coaching, teaching, and we have to give them a way to find the solution. And they're very clever. Um, they, they, their, their brains like are sponges. My players, young players are sponges. And you might not think they listen or look, but actually they do. And when you actually turn around and go, Okay, I, to go back to your question, sometimes um, I take prep four times a week, but Friday, we generally play Saturday. Friday morning, I go freestyle, you take your own prep. Now, sometimes I have to guide it and go, listen, okay, yeah, you're, you're, you're only messing about now. You're not actually, you know, they see it as a, a morning off for 15 minutes. So you kind of guide it um, while just observing, and then you just pull the individual who's not really, doing what they should be doing or doing anything at all. And you kind of um, you have a silent word with them. And over time, you'll see that they, they, they start to have a little routine of things they like to do. Um, usually my, we have three gym-based sessions, or power strength-based sessions across the week. And usually the third one is on a Thursday after a pretty heavy session. I, I'll often call that freestyle, where you can do some uppers and lowers or, or a mixture of exercises you like. But please run them by me first so that I can... Make sure they're not, you know, if you're going to be loading your hamstrings too heavy before a game on Saturday. But generally what you'll find them doing is core and pull-ups, push-ups. Um, they, you know, they'll always find something they like to do. They're young boys, so they might do some curls, some extra shoulder work. And I'll actually give them exercise to do. I'll show them ones if they think, oh, yeah, can we do a bit of this? And it's, it, it just drives a little bit of, okay, ownership, I think is the word. Um, and I'm lucky that at this stage, they're pretty good at that, most of them. Occasionally, my pitch base warm up. So I'll ask the captain to take today. You're going to take the 10 minute pitch base warm up um, and see who listens. And because they do, um, as part of their education with me, I, I do run little workshops on GPS and monitoring and warm ups and cool downs, etc. They have to do it as part of their apprenticeship, but it gives me a chance to go, okay, name two hamstring stretches that I've shown you or even demonstrate them. And it's very interesting then when you go, because they become robots. You, you know, they look, look at me, do this, do that 10 times. They do it 10 times as they're chatting. But when you actually go, okay, show me a hamstring stretch, they go, well, what, what, what? so yeah, sometimes I, I'll ask a captain to take the, 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 the warm up on a Friday before the game or even early in the week on a Monday when we've just played a, a lot of games and we want to just, it's a restart day. So 
Um, again, that takes buy-in from the coaches. Sometimes that's not appropriate. The technical staff go, well, you're not doing your job. But um, So there's a few bits like that. And I do encourage the boys to question the programs. That's the big thing for me. Um, we often, and it was a, a colleague of mine, Dominic May, who works with the under U23s. He does this all the time with the older players. He, got, he, he sends out a little survey to them at the start of the season and says, okay, tell me what you think you need to work on. Tell me what you like and don't like exercise index based and then he goes through that and tries to give them and i started doing it it's actually really cool and now you you try to give them what you know they need based on their physical profiling while giving them a little bit of what they like because actually if they, if they don't like what they're doing they're not going to commit to the program um so that's a, another thing i've done in the past not so much this time was at the end of a session i'll give 10 minutes for what i call free play or freestyle instead of having a whole session so if it's a heavy leg session or my power session, then I go, okay, well, boys, if you've completed all the work I've asked you to do, you've got 10 minutes now to maybe play some football tennis, maybe do extra core, or you want to do extra agility or whatever you want to do, and I'll set it up for you. So they're just small little ways of kind of trying to break the monotony. I think one of those, when you look at the, when I talk about education earlier, and we study strength and conditioning in sports science, and one of the training variables people really forget is variety. Um, and I'm not saying variety for the sake of variety, because you see that too much. I think you see that certainly on social media too much, where coaches and trainers are just delivering something that's cool because they get buy-in from the players. But actually, a bit of variety within your sessions is across the, the periodized plan is always important. And sometimes the variety might not have any, you know, philosophy behind it. It might be variety for the sake of variety. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking about some foot stuff and ankle stuff I'm doing so. I've been doing all of the ankle stars and the mobility stability stuff for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then I could see they were starting to get a bit disengaged. So the other day I brought 10 footballs into the gym, soccer balls, and got them in pairs, doing little half follies, doing little keep ups while balancing on one leg or, you know, jumping and turning. When they say turn, jump, turn on one leg without dropping your foot, going from an RDL position into a little half volley, single leg or L position into a little half volley little CMJ headers, you do three CMJs and they head the ball in the last one just to get them engaged with each other. And actually it worked beautifully. Um, so we're going to do that a lot more. Simple wins, but they're going, okay, this is, that was warm up 81 with me this season. So you put in a little bit of variety and you get a lot back. Um, I didn't get half the work I wanted done, done because the ball was involved. But actually <laughs> I got... I got more joy, I think, and a little bit more buy-in from, from them. So they're small little things, but. I, I really like that. And with the soccer culture, not everyone's going to be pumped about going into the gym and lifting weights and doing the basics over and over again. But that variety just keeps that interest, keeps them engaged. And there's that, that balance between doing both. And I know last time we talked, we had like a three hour Zoom discussion. <laughs> that was really fun. It felt like 10 minutes though. But mm. I remember you telling me that if anyone were to take a look into your gym sessions, they would be like, wow, this is really simple. And that's something that, that is missing. And like you said, with social media and everyone trying to reinvent the wheel and do all the cool things to get the followers or to get the clients or to just impress their colleagues, they're not necessarily doing their athletes a service because no one's really getting better at the, the big rock things, the, the main strength movements and just overall movement quality. So if we were to look into one of your sessions right now, what would you be doing for just a general strength session? So on a, and bear in mind, there is time, as I said, for a variety. There is time to jazz it up and, and add, like when you've got an athlete with a good training age, but yeah. the majority of the athletes, even if they've come through our, our system from you know, 14, 15, 16, they still need to build the basics because they're only they're only learning those basics in the youth academy. Now, when they get to me, I believe it's time to work. They're ready to work. So I think a Tuesday is a good example for me. So Tuesday is my speed power day. That's my acceleration max speed day. It's uh, three days after a game and it's three days before the next game. So it's a safe window. And on a Wednesday, then they have a Wednesday off to do a full day education recovery day. So 
Tuesday morning will start with generally depending if they've been in our system for a while and or they've been, you know, they're, they're quick learners. Tuesday will start pre-training. And this is where I think sometimes if you looked in, you go, okay, this is where coaches get frightened because they look in and they go, well, they're doing this before they go out and run around 10K, 8, 9, 10K. They'll do power cleans for power, like in, in terms of strength speed, um, maybe low volume, three, four, five sets of three or two, depending on their ability. Some, some of the taller boys, might, uh, my, my center backs might do some hang power cleans because their limb length and their range just isn't built from taking a bar from the floor. And people might go, why well, teach them to take it from the floor? Well, some of my center backs are six, six foot five and their, their, their biomechanics don't suit pulling from the floor because they've got a short back, really long femurs, etc. So they'll do that. Then they'll do some linear hurdle hops. So we'll start with hop and stick or we'll start with really reactive. Uh, some of the really good boys can now do 10 hurdle hops without barely touching the floor. And now we're up to we're up to hurdles now that are beyond waist height. They're almost at belly button height after a number of weeks. They'll do some overhead med ball throws or rotational med ball throws. And I'll really then we'll do something reactive like a resisted sprint, whether that's on a run rocket or on a sled, a really light sled, just to teach what I call first step acceleration mechanics over five to 10 yards. It's not very heavy where I'm trying to build that strength, running strength. It's literally to teach them we're going to have to do speed now. Let's see, can we have short, choppy, aggressive steps in the first five to 10 yards? Uh, and that's gym-based. Uh, that's after a warm-up, of course, and some re- uh, activation stuff. Then we'll go out onto the pitch, and I'll have about 15 minutes where I'll build up to do some speed mechanic work. And that this is where it's very linear and very progressive. Is It's simple, basic, A skips, B skips, um, some wall drills, maybe some pop skips and floats. I love, I love pogos into tuck jumps on the pitch, Pole goes into tuck jumps into an acceleration. And then we start building up our accelerations over 35 to 40 meters, which is probably 40 yards um, to get a max speed effort. And this is where it gets interesting because we, we, I like to periodize and use lots of different starts, two point starts, three point starts, falling starts, kneeling starts, uh, lying on the ground starts. And they all look at me, why, why are we, why, we never, we never fall on the ground and then have to get up off our chest and sprint. But, I like it. I use it as a tool to practice popping up and getting your feet in the right position before you accelerate. Um, and we always finish with races. The, I believe we spoke about this. Um, if you're trying to get fast, you have to race someone. I, I believe you have to. Um, once the, and, and the mechanics can go out the window a little bit there because ultimately it's, I don't care who gets there first. Um, and I always coach in speed. I always drive that it's more than just the quickest person. It's the person who quick, reacts the quickest person who can turn the quickest sometimes is the person who you know cheats a little bit gets a bit quicker because on the pitch if you can do that if you can lie in an offside position and not be seen you get there quicker um so we always have races and we'll have a little leaderboard with the races then that goes into our, our pitch based training which is an extensive day of you know 800 900 meters high speed running 7 to 8k that's our big football fitness work day um, and then after that we'll go in and load in the gym so pre-covid we would have gone in um, had some lunch, had a two-hour rest, and then done a, a prop, a big gym session. But I'm kind of restricted with time at the moment. So now we will go in and um, kind of get a protein snack or some fruit or something uh, in the nutrition room, and then we'll come in and start our... And this is where I do my lower body session predominantly because it's the kind of safest time to do it. I like I like to microdose lower body ac- activities across the week. So we will also do lower body activities, generally unilateral stuff on a Thursday, low volume, um, but I like to microdose, and I know people, there's lots of different um, philosophies around this, I suppose. With the older athlete, you have your upper body day, your lower body day, et cetera. But for me, my upper body day is Monday because it's two days after a game, offload the legs. Uh, Tuesday then will be a mix of bilateral lower body, and then Thursday will be a mixture of unilateral lower body and some core exercise. So. Tuesday might look like back squat or hex bar deadlift, depending on your, your frame and ability, RDL. Um, obviously, we do for the hamstring, um, posterior chain, or like a back extension or a glute ham hold, depending on the athlete again. Then I'll always go into some sort of groin exercise. And so I, I'll, my, they'll be my two big strength exercises. So they are young athletes, and they've, they're after big load that day. So I don't believe they can tolerate a lot of volume. So I'll do two to three big strength exercises. Bear in mind they've done their power cleans previous. 
Now, now they're doing like a big compound back squat, uh, RDL or a hex bar deadlift and a uh, glue ham raise, etc. for low volume, low, high intensity. But then the groin stuff, I do some, I like to do some volume on the groin and the calf work or we'll do some um, hip, hip conditioning or groin conditioning. So that'll be like a reformer uh, sways or it might be a slide board lateral lunge. I love the slide board lateral lunge. Um, um, some of the taller boys, if they've got, this is where I try to be a little bit clever. If they've got poor movement, if they're, you know, a bit tall and mobility, stability isn't good, and maybe I've, I've got them from a different club and they haven't that athletic development background, then I like to do lateral step up because you're teaching some stability, mobility while getting a little bit of groin activity in there, but you're focusing on stability, mobility um, of the hip, knee and ankle. And then I'll do some core exercises. I like to do anti-rotation before I do rotation. So I go anti-rotation, rotation, flexion. Um, then on the Thursday, we'll go uh, anti-flexion. We'll do more rotations, but dynamic rotations where it's power-based. And that's kind of generally, it's very, very straightforward with me. Um, big compound movements followed by um, a little bit of volume in the calf and soleus to help deceleration mechanics, to help acceleration mechanics. Um, to help the foot and then you know the, the groins and hips is uh, particularly the way our Arsenal players play you know trying to be a highly technical player dominate possession um, hips and groins are always a problem are always sore or tired so I, I slowly over from pre-season to in-season slowly drip feed in some volume into the um, between 8, 10, 12 reps on the, the groin stuff I don't like to overload the groin hip complex with large load um, in a in a lateral plane so that's generally how it looks it's it's that's it in a nutshell i hope that comes across clear because in my head i was going through my day but yeah it definitely does and i think a lot of the people listening who are hesitant to do in-season training so a lot of youth players in, in the states who aren't in the academy system and who kind of have to like do their own program or find their own strength coach they are hesitant to do in-season training, but I love how you mentioned that you can, you can get it all in, just be smart with your volume, be smart with what days you do everything on upper body earlier in the week, speed and power earlier in the week. And that's another thing. People think you can't improve during the season, especially with speed, but that's the time to do it. And that's why that year round template is so critical in long-term athletic development because I see too many kids, they'll take three to four months off from their performance training. And then they wonder why come next season, they're not faster or maybe they, they hit a wall or maybe they're injured. So I'm really thankful that you spoke to what exactly you're doing throughout the week during the season. And I'll link a bunch of resources, you guys, on different schools of thought. I love Potty's template, but it's going to be very different for every age group and, and every organization. So I'll link a few, few articles in the show notes. Um, I do want to shift to mental health for coaches because I know that's a a big topic not not talked a, a lot about, but it's very real that a lot of coaches who work with the pros and at a high level are are struggling because of the pressure or management or the schedule constantly being on the road. There's coaches who are also in the private sector like me who are struggling because they're running a business, but serving the athlete, talking to parents, and it's just a lot. It's it's a very demanding inner industry the stakes are high and people want to to make sure that they're they're investing their time properly so what are you doing as far as taking care of your mental health as a coach well that's yeah that's a very hot topic i think at the moment as well and obviously anyone on social media will see you'll see coaches stepping out of positions currently in elite sport or performance sport or the performance end of the game You'll see all sorts of, there's a big plug on mental health at the moment. I think there has to be um, off the back of lockdown and COVID and all that as well. But I've seen it deteriorate. I've personally and professionally, I've seen the mental health of coaches and, and the people that I certainly would talk to on a daily basis or a monthly basis. I've, I've seen it really deteriorate in the last six to seven to eight years. Because I think on certainly performance coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, there's more pressure now because there's, 
there's more of us. It's completely saturated market with experts. Everyone's an expert. Um, you know, there's, it's a really, everyone's a specialist. <laughs> everyone's a specialist. And if you're in the game, if you're in the game a long time, like I have, I was 20 years in the game and, um, you know, I didn't have many, you know, resources for that growing up or for looking at mental health or looking at, you know, and you just thought it was just get on with it because, you know, it is a very intense job we do. And I think actually the mental health comes from burnout. First of all, I think it comes from physical burnout and pressure. And then it comes from, you know, that uh, little bit of anxiety around, oh, you know, I have to keep this athlete happy because, you know, he's not happy with my program or the coach isn't happy with my program or, you might have a brilliant season this season and then you go in and there's a new coach next season who completely does not like anything to do with what you're doing, uh, even though you're renowned for what you do and all those things. And um, I think my, my, I suppose, I'm currently working very hard on my mental health. Uh, this season in particular has been hard for me. Um, I haven't, um, there's been a lot of change in my environment and work, which has led to me you know, having to work on different things and new challenges, which is, that's normal, that always happens. But actually it's, it's deeper. I think it's deeper seed than that. It, it seems to come from burnout from the profession. Um, and I don't mind saying that because I, I've been talking to some, some of my colleagues, some of my mentors, and, and they're the same. Um, I think the last two years with lockdown and any of us that have been like sport was one of the first things to go back uh, when restrictions were, were lifting. And it was very intense. Um, you know, particularly at our club, we probably 40 percent of the staff were back on site doing all the work. Uh, you know, when when it was really intense to keep people safe and ensure that the boys stayed safe and didn't pick up COVID and we continued to get ready to train and play competitively. And I found that very difficult. Um, and I suppose it's only paying its effect now. So what do I do? Well, I broke a lot of habits because, I, you know, it can be a six day a week job, 12 hours a day if you let it, if you let it be that. And I don't think you're ever off because the phone is always on. So that's the big one for me is the phone. Um you're always reachable as a performance coach. You're always reachable if you're working with squads. Um, oh, because things change. Oh, by the way, we party nine o'clock at night. We don't have this player tomorrow. What are we going to do? We have to change the whole session. And it becomes this, this high pressure, this high anxiety. There's a little change and suddenly there's a big, it has a massive knock-on effect. So I've started like, when I finish work, turn the phone off. Just, you know, if it's that important, um, you know, no, in, in what I do, no one dies. So if I do something wrong at work, unless I drop a barbell on someone's head, <laughs> if I don't warm someone up wrong, they get, could get injured. If, you know, if maybe they're not getting stronger or faster, they might not get a contract. But no one dies. It's, it's, you know, it's a luxury. I work in a luxury industry where people pay a lot of money to watch my boys run around. Um, so I'm currently back training, doing a little bit of training because I'd lost that appetite for training because I was so tired of the facility. I was so tired of the the job like I got into the profession because I loved training and I love lifting and I only spoke to an old colleague of mine that I, I lifted with and competed with I hadn't spoken to him in two or three years during the week and I was telling him how I was and he goes man that's not you like you you were the life and soul of the gym and you ate right you trained right you slept right I enjoyed myself at the weekends but I made and I loved competing and I loved training and that fell away in the last five to six years uh, I think due to just the volume of work, really. Um, and there's always an excuse because my colleagues, my, my colleagues, they all train. Like, but somehow in my head, I just got bored of the place. I got bored of the system. And I was like, I can't. No interest in putting a bar on a plate here. I have no interest in going for a run. I don't. So that's back on track, thankfully. And that's been a big part. So exercise, I don't mean to tell anyone. Exercise and good food leads to better sleep. I'm also getting some psychotherapy sessions, um, which is interesting. I've always, I've always tried to train my brain. I've had some ups and downs in my life where I've had to see counselors for various different things. My mom passed away six years ago and uh, I found that very hard. So I've had to deal with that. Um, different things growing up, you know, you, you, and I talk about this openly now on a podcast and a few of my people around me might not even know that, but I don't, you know, it's, it's, it has to be talked about. And so I, on my day off now on a Wednesday, I see a psychotherapist to really, and I didn't know the difference between counseling psychotherapy or psychology until now, it really is training you to put things to identify triggers that, you know, cause anxiety or cause depression. And how do you fix that? Or what are the simple tools you can put in place to, um, 
you know, help you cope when there is a pressure situation. So, you know, at, at the moment of work, I have brilliant days and I've got bad days like anyone. And there's, you know, the, the athletes keep me going because ultimately I'm there for them. So a couple of psychotherapy sessions, better food, exercise, turn the phone off if you can, the work phone, if you've got one. And I think really, really focus on what, why did you do, why are you in this job? Why are you doing what you do? Um, Cause I know a lot of people are thick skinned and they go, well, you know, it's amazing badge. It's Arsenal. It's this, it's that, but it's, it's not, it's about the player. It's about the young man in front of you and having an impact on their life because they have an impact on your life because you spend 12 hours or 13 hours a week and day in the facility. Uh, sometimes less, sometimes you've got really short days, but a lot of the time, you know, if you're on an away tour or an away trip, you could be with them 24 hours. Um, we were in Dallas, brilliant tournament in Dallas uh, three years ago, 10 days on the road. And that, I think that takes its toll on you. It's exciting, it's brilliant, it's positive, but it is exhausting. And then you come back and your, your wife or partner hasn't seen you in 10 days, two weeks, and you don't get it. You get one day off and you're back into your normal six day routine again. So that, that was just taking its toll on me. And it's just, a, and I think for me in youth development, it doesn't have to be like that. I think you can actually get balance. Um, but at the minute, it just seems to be, and I've talked to people in other sports and other clubs, and it, it's, it's full on at the moment. I think that lockdown period when we lost maybe 20 weeks of training, people are now trying to make up for it. And um, that, that's just had a, a toll on me. Uh, and that's really how I deal with it. And what's scary, Erica, is that now that I'm, I'm open and honest with a few of my colleagues at work, they're the same. And they just were afraid to talk about it or didn't know how to talk about it, didn't know how to approach it because it's a, it's a macho world we live in and it's you know you're deemed to be there's Paddy who's the ex powerful weightlifter and he's talking about mental health and he's, he's he, is he soft is he is there something wrong with him you know is he too emotional and no I'm just my brain needs to recalculate and refocus because I haven't been able to focus I haven't been able to concentrate and it's it's you know things suffer my personal life was suffering because of it so back on track we're not we're not we're not back to uh, you know, world weightlifting standard yet, but <laughs> that's how that ever was. But we're not we're not back to where we were, but we're getting there. You're definitely a lot better than when we last talked a few months ago. And I'm I'm really happy for you. And I'm just so glad that you're just taking action with your your training and your sleep and nutrition. And I know it's stuff we all preach. But I think people are under the impression that us strength coaches are like always dialed in with that stuff, but they don't realize how busy and how demanding our jobs are. Like we rarely have time for our own training and it's, it's crazy, but it's just the reality of it. And I think there are ways to navigate and find that balance again and kind of see where you are putting your energy and then shift back to things that serve you. And I think you've done a really good job of that. And I can't begin to explain how impactful therapy is. And I, I, you do it. I do it myself Been doing it for the past six months. And I think it's becoming more of the cool thing to do now. Like <laughs> I know a lot of my friends see a therapist and it's just so beneficial. And when we talked off air, it's just so nice to have that, that outside perspective and someone who's not your spouse and not your friends. And you're not constantly venting to the same people because when you vent to people who are in your corner, they also have biases and blind spots. And they're going to say, well, they're going to agree with you and kind of just like egg you on. Whereas the therapist is like giving that more like objective perspective and getting you familiar with your emotions and your triggers and just really talking through things in a, in a non-emotional way. So I love that. And I, I think as far as the, the coming back to your why is also really really important. And, and you asked me that question when we talked on zoom, you're like, why do you do this? And that's not a question that us coaches are really given. And we don't, we don't ask ourselves and it's important to get clear on it because when things do get tough, 
you're reminded, okay, this is why I'm doing it. I'm doing it to serve my athletes. I'm doing it to make an impact on not just their playing, but just their overall development as humans. And again, that's why I really love what you do because you really look at the athlete and the human and you really care about your players. And I can, I can just see that from your work and the way you talk about it. So for that, I'm thankful for being able to be a friend of yours. And thank you for the feedback on that. Cause I think, uh, again, I'm, I'm an open book, but it's the mental health side of things is like we spend so much money on gym memberships to train our body or the, the latest bike to go and race in a triathlon or, but actually, how do we separate, you know, how do we train our brain to, to, you know, mental shelf work and park it or mental shelf this reaction from a coach now that has completely thrown your whole day because, you know, they, they're not happy with something or this player who's been awkward. Or, and, you know, I, I don't feel it's, I don't feel I have the right to tell my players they need to go and see the sports psychologist because they've got performance anxiety or they are struggling with social aspects of, fitting into an elite academy. And I, I, I think we forget that, like the pressure on young athletes to perform. When I said they're only young, they are only teenagers, like is immense. And there's this expectation that you're going to be this top player. And I don't think as a staff member, certainly I would consider myself as more than a staff member or a support staff for these boys. I believe I impact them in other ways. And that's why I love what you do because we talk about the holistic development. That's what we talk about. We don't talk about specific strength, power, speed. It's about how do we make the person better because so few will make it. And I think us as coaches and support staff and athletic development staff, physios, doctors need to understand that. And I think that macho stereotype is still there because, you know, psychotherapy, psychologist, therapy. Oh, you're going to the therapy. What's wrong with him? He's losing his brain. His head's falling off. No, I'm just struggling to compartmentalized things that are affecting other things so how do i put a structure in place that again identifies the triggers and have little tools and it's, it's actually very simple as you say talking to a stranger it literally is what before you know it they're pointing out the trigger and trigger isn't always work and i love my work it can be something else that i've forgotten to do to, to mind myself that is now causing anxiety and it's a vicious circle because before you know it, it's two, three years and you're, you haven't dealt with it and it's a problem. So yeah, we're, we're, we're certainly, uh, I'm actually looking at sports psychology as a professional or, or psychology as a profession further down the line. I'm fascinated by it. Um, particularly the young brain, because again, we're asking teenagers to be adults, their brain isn't fully formed. Um, and the pressure and anxiety now because everything is on social media as coaches as athletes everything we do good or bad can be berated on social media or loved on social media and one i think that love on social media has as much impact on your brain as the hate on social media so or the dislike so i think we need to be i just think we need to learn to protect ourselves yeah i i think you're such a, a good example to your athletes because it, it isn't just physical. It isn't just going in the gym and doing your RDLs or improving your speed times or performing in, in matches. It's, it's about, are you mentally resilient? Can you navigate your emotions and, and understand your triggers? And can you communicate with people? Can you listen? It's, it's so much more than, than the physical side. And I think you opening up about this is going to inspire other coaches and, and even athletes. Hey, I need to strengthen my mind as much as my body. And I, I can't go through life just focusing on, on one thing because when things get hard, how am I, how am I going to handle it? Why will, will I be okay? And one, one other thing you had mentioned to me was like, it's okay to not be okay. <laughs> it's, <laughs> totally, totally fine. I, I think if you're not okay and you don't do anything about it, that's when it becomes problematic, but it's okay to be like, look, I'm not mentally good right now, but it's time to do something about it and get my mental health back. Even if it's going to be a long process, that's okay. 
I'm taking small steps in the right direction to get my mental health back. So I'm grateful that that you opened up and, and shared your experience with this. And I know it's going to impact a lot of my listeners. And if there's anything you want to close out with, I know you dropped a lot of mics in this episode, <laughs> but if there's any takeaway message you have on youth development or physical and mental health, what do you want the people to know? I suppose my whole philosophy is brilliant basics, whatever you're doing, um, basic and consistent, um, whether that's a strength program, a speed program, power program, basic and progressive. You need to be able to plan it, measure it and change it. Um, yes, you need variety for the sake of variety, but if you're working with, and it was Dr. Joe Eisenman, I presented it at the Child of Champion Conference three years ago with Dr. Joe, and if anyone knows Dr. Joe, phenomenal human being for content and a wonderful man and I've, I've loved meeting him in person a couple of times and he's visited us awesome. and like he done this wonderful presentation on maturation development and the, of the brain of the body and there was three things that stood out to me and it lives with me now I just didn't know it <laughs> in order to develop whether that's physical or you know to become a better sports person or to be a better athlete you need three things you need genetics nutrients and environment so we, you know, if I want to be better in the gym myself, I, I, I have good genetics, but even if you've got bad genetics, you can change the other too. <laughs> so it's very important that we have good nutrition, good nutrients, whether, and that includes sleep and recovery, good environment. So, you know, um, if you're not coming from a good environment or you're not going into a good environment, then you're in trouble. And I, I've said it in the past, I use the analogy that your, your, your facility should be like a greenhouse where people come to go. And if it's not, then particularly with young players, then you're wasting your time because um, I have a lot of players coming from various backgrounds, uh, socioeconomic, uh, from all parts of London and the UK and Europe. Some have wonderful backgrounds, some don't have wonderful backgrounds. And I think you might've tweeted it a couple of months back that remember to be kind to someone when they come in your door because you don't know what they're going home to. So you have an impact on your athletes far greater than you know you have. And that comes from all aspects of development. So be kind, be fair, be consistent and be patient. Great, great closing thoughts. I, I appreciate all of your wisdom today, Potty, and I'm sure we'll do another episode at some point, but this is going to be an amazing one for people to hear. So thank you again for coming on.